Hi, I am Ozzy Girard, the host of OzBuzz, and today I have the great pleasure to chat with David Steele, who is the co-founder and general partner of Western Wealth Capital. Welcome, David. Thank you, Ozzy. Great to be here. Yeah, I want to chat with you because I've known you for a while, and you are, of course, uh, noted as an entrepreneurial executive on your website. What the heck is an entrepreneurial executive? Well, I guess I'm not really an executive, but I'm an entrepreneur, and you have to find a nice way to say that. Yeah, it is. Uh, I can't remember having seen that, but it's true. That's probably, probably what you are. And certainly when you look at your background in terms of you used to be the CEO of International Properties Group, which was listed on the TSX, and that's where you cut your teeth on condominiums, didn't you? Exactly. That's where we met. You actually did our website back that's right. 20, we had a web company. 20 some years ago when, we, when the dot, dot com boom was hitting, coming up to year 2000. And and uh, yeah, that was interesting. You paid me twelve dollars, <laughs> and you raised uh, tw twenty million or something like that. <laughs> well, not quite as exaggerated as that, but no. But you always had you took properties that were either just needed tender loving care, or you repositioned them and and marketed them to investors, and you created a lot of wealth for people. Yeah, I mean the formula really hasn't changed over thirty years. I mean the prices have gone higher, and the uh, the markets have changed, but the formula is really. You know, real estate, the formula, it's all about finding a formula, and if you can get a good formula and repeat it, it's really what the, that's really it's like the key having to the a business. system, you know, and not deviating from it. And uh, we, we can get into that if you like a little later. But you did some 85 projects there, 7,000 units. It seemed like it was superlative, but that's nothing as what you have been doing since then, no? Yeah, I mean, it was amazing. So, you know, if you go back to the 90s, uh, there were lots of apartment buildings that could be turned into condominiums. Uh, we bought, uh, well, it's kind of funny because the first building we started, my partner Phil and I graduated from the University of Calgary, and we shared the distinction of graduating in the top 10% of the bottom third of our class every <laughs> year. Um, so we were definitely not the two smart guys sitting in the front row. Uh, we were the guys at the back of the class planning the year-end party at the, for the last day of <laughs> university. Um, but, you know, from all the different things we did, entrepreneurial ventures we did through university, we became good friends and decided, hey, we really need to do something together. Um, and the first real estate deal we did is we bought a little 16 suite apartment building in Calgary, in Southwest Calgary, in Lower Mount Royal, which is a really good neighborhood in Calgary. And we paid $26,000 <laughs> a suite, okay? Big and, bucks. Yeah, and it was kind of wild because, um, uh, because our, our fix up at the time, if you will, was we put an awning on the building, yeah. we ripped the carpet out because they had hardwood floors, and we painted all around the windows, we painted the, the outside coverings on the windows, this, this mauve purple, which as you remember was yeah. the color of the <laughs> 1990s. And that's what we did, and the building went from $26,000 a unit to 40000 a unit. And I still remember the day we sold that building, and we sold it for forty-one or forty-two thousand dollars a unit, and we both walked away with a check for a hundred thousand dollars. And you were happy. And we thought we were the <laughs> smartest two guys that had ever walked the earth, yeah. not realizing that today all we would have ever had to do was yeah, hold on to it, it <laughs> and they're worth about three hundred and fifty thousand dollars a unit. Yeah. So you know, as they say uh, in real estate, you win some, you lose some. But it was a good thing because um, you know we really, we really that got us the bug of buying real estate. Um, and kind of what's an interesting side to that story is that when we bought that building, we registered the name in Canada, Trump Developments. <laughs> so we called that building Trump Gardens. And then we bought another one, and it was a four-story building. This one was only two-story. This next one was four-story because it was built bigger. We called that one Trump Tower. <laughs> um, and then we bought another one just down the road, and it was another 20-sweeter. And we called that one Trump Place. So we had Trump Gardens, Trump Tower, and Trump Place. And these were all in Lower Mount Royal, really nice area in Calgary. And then we decided that there was one that was on the other side of 14th Street. Well, the other side of 14th Street in Calgary is called Bankview. And while Mount Royal is a great area, Bankview is not, Bankview quite, is not quite Mount Royal. <laughs> 
And we thought, well, we're getting it for a cheaper price. We'll fix it up and we'll sell it. Well, we couldn't sell it. Yeah. So within our office, that building became known as Trump Dump because <laughs> we couldn't sell it. Now, we ended up selling it. We didn't make as much money, yeah. but it also taught us a very important lesson that Area it's cons. a big difference if you're on the one side of 14th Street or the other. That's right. But the, the thing is, that with Trump, of course, that is way, way ahead of Mr. Trump becoming president. Oh, yeah. And I think, uh, didn't they resent you using the name in retrospect? Or? Well, if you fast forward another till 2015, uh, again, we're, we're, building an, we're building a condo building up in Fort St. John, and I walk into one of our management meetings, and someone says, Dave, we're going to build this new building. And I said, what do you want to call it? And they said, we're going to call it Sterling Place. <laughs> I still remember the name and I thought to myself, my God, that is the worst name you could ever name an apartment building. So I said, I'll tell you what, unless you guys have a better name by tomorrow morning at eight o'clock, we're calling it Trump Gardens. And they said, Dave, you can't call it Trump Gardens. And I said, why not? And they said, well, you don't own the name to Trump. And I said, well, actually, as a matter of fact, I do. I've had the name since 1994. <laughs> so we came back to the meeting the next morning <laughs> and, uh, and no one had a better name. So we ended up building a building in Fort St. John called Trump Gardens. And the building sold out. It was, a, it was a condo building and it sold out literally in record time. I'm not sure it sold out because it was called Trump no. Gardens, but it, but it sold out. Good and, timing. Yeah, good timing and it was very good. And in April of 2015, I get a letter <laughs> in the mail from Donald Trump's lawyer. And it's not the famous lawyer that's in jail right now. Yeah. What's his name, Michael? Cohen. Yeah, no, it's not, it wasn't from Michael Cohen because ah. I went back last week and looked just because ah. someone asked me. But it was from another lawyer. And the letter basically went on to say, I am the lawyer for Donald Trump, the renowned entrepreneur, the incredible real estate. It was two pages of just <laughs> self-flattery of Donald Trump. And so when I showed it to my lawyer, my lawyer said, Dave, you know, I dislike Donald Trump so much that if you want, I'll make the call back to this lawyer and I won't charge you because I just, yeah. there's no way you're making this call yeah. and you're not going to let me sit in on it. So uh, we get on the call with Donald Trump's lawyer and Donald Trump's lawyer goes on and on and on about the fact that yeah. did you know we're violating uh, trademark law and Donald Trump has the name Trump in Canada and he's halfway through his dissertation and I said to him, like you have gone to the corporate records office and you do realize that we own the name Trump Developments LTD, which we've owned before you got the trade name Trump in Canada. <laughs> and there was dead silence, silence on the phone. Yeah, and that was it. And yeah, that was it. And he said, he said, let me get back to you. And literally a couple of weeks later, the news was all over the news that Donald Trump yeah. was running for president. We never heard back from him. So well, I think you had important things <laughs> to do. Yeah. Well, I, I don't feel bad about Mr. Trump at all. I mean, long became, before he became president, he wrote a book called The Best Reader's Advice I yes. Ever Received, and I had a chapter in it, and I was the only Canadian, quite proud. Then he became president, was even more proud, and now I have to defend myself. So, so <laughs> one final note on that yeah. is that, you know, everything in life goes around in a full circle, as yeah. you know, right? So. Now it's one of those things, careful what you wish for. Yeah. Now I have a building in Fort St. John <laughs> called Trump Gardens, and I'm yeah. not sure how many people drive up to rent it every day and look and go, do I really want to rent a building with Trump's name on it, if well, it's perceived to be Trump's well, name? Well, you, you can be rest uh -huh. assured that, that 66 million Americans voted for him, yeah. and they're probably heck of a lot of Canadians <laughs> do too, but so much for Trump. Uh -huh. But the thing is, you've had real estate sort of edged on your forehead, you know, and you've done so extremely well with it. But part is you're also very much involved in other things, like the entrepreneur organization, which is a non-profit organization, and you were the, the uh, president of that organization in the, in the 90s. And there were some 7,500 people, and you've made a lot of contacts there. No? Yeah, it's amazing. Today, there's 12,000 entrepreneurs around the world. It's got wow. chapters in India, China, all across Europe and Africa. The United States and Canada. I mean, it's it's a it's just a it's one of those things where there's an annual conference and you get to go and meet the other entrepreneurs and you you know it's very inspirational because you just see so many people that you know every time I go I feel like I'm no matter how much I'm doing I'm still in second gear because you know there's people growing their companies at 25 that are selling them for a billion dollars and yeah and yeah. so it's you know it's very inspirational and it's a it's become a fabulous resource for other entrepreneurs looking to 
you know, f entrepreneurs are like real estate investors, right? There's great networks and organizations for real estate sure. people to get together. And, you know, it's funny when you put a room of real estate people together, the volume in the room goes up very fast, <laughs> right? And it's, it's the same with entrepreneurs. Sure. It's yeah. just a very like-minded... Yeah. Uh, it's no question. We had the Landrush conference in Vancouver last Saturday, and there was a hum and a din, you know, in the hallway. It was bigger than inside <laughs> the, the, the speakers. But yeah, people are interested, but they're interested in personal growth. And when you look around the world, some of the best ways to get personal growth and personal wealth is through real estate. But it isn't as easy as all that. You have to understand it. You have, as you said earlier, select the right area, the right product. And when you went down to the United States, uh, I guess with Janet LePage, uh, what, what was sort of the secret of your success? Because literally you started with what, one building and ended up with 10,000 units. Yeah, I mean, I think the real secret is we just, we got a formula and I think it's, you know, it's the best formula that I've seen in real estate in 30 years. Um, you know, the, the real estate market in the US is dominated predominantly um, you know, multifamily apartments are, are owned predominantly today by ma and pa operators. So two school teachers out of Sacramento own the building in Phoenix or two dentists out of Austin, Texas own the building in Dallas. And so, you know, as you know from owning real estate, you can't run real estate from afar. You can't take this $25 million asset and just hand it to a property manager and hope, hope that they'll the run it, hope for yeah. the best. And so, so what, what we've been able to do is we've been able to create a system of working with the property managers where our asset management team is really hands-on. We do a lot of things to really transform and modify these buildings, and we do it really fast. And so, you know, it's a... Well, if it's fast, the tenants, they're, they're used to getting lots of promises and never see anything. So if you do it fast, that gets you off on the right foot. Well, we, we do it right now where we do 45 or 50 things that we do to the building that we do on the day we take over. There you go. So much so that when the tenant leaves to go to work on the, on the morning of takeover, Ozzy, when they leave to go to work, they come home at four o'clock in the afternoon and the building's been transformed. The pool furniture's been changed. The signage has been changed. We've already started renovating the leasing office. We've got the model suite under, you know, you've got all these things going. And you know, what I always say is people don't mind paying more rent. They don't wanna pay more rent on a promise of things being done. Exactly. Because that promise has been broken to them too many times. Yeah, and sometimes a developer or an owner goes and renovates one or two units and leaves the old garbage furniture on the pool or some of the, the they have maybe a barbecue and it's all rusted up or some, you know, it's, it's not this big a deal, but the totality of making all of these changes at once, people say, oh, hey, you know, these guys mean business. Yeah, no, it's, it, it, it's really amazing because you know, if you take the top 10 or 12 markets in the US and you know, the formula is really strong because you know, it's where the people are moving to, where the jobs are being created. The average rent right now in San Francisco for a two bedroom is $4,200 a month, <laughs> okay? US. <laughs> US. So that means that if I'm Google or Intel or one of these big companies, Apple, and I'm operating in the Silicon Valley, I'm paying my programmers $220,000 a year mainly because they've got to pay $4,200 a month rent. So those companies now in droves are moving to Dallas, Houston, Phoenix, Atlanta, Las Vegas, Denver. They're moving to these other cities because the rent is $800 or $1,000. It's a quarter of the price and the cost of living for that same programmer is about $100,000 a year. So there's no charity with Google. There's no charity no, with Intel. Just They're just business. doing straight math saying, yeah. we're gonna move to these areas. So if you follow the demographic shift, there's all these people moving to these more affordable locations. And there's all this 1980s product. And the 1980s product in its current form, unrenovated, when you walk inside, it's got the plush carpeting. It's got the turquoise toilets. It's got the kind of unit <laughs> yeah. that you and I wouldn't want our kids to go and rent. Sure, sure. And so the classic unit rents for $800. When we do our full renovation on it, it rents for about $1,100. But the people that are moving there, if they don't pay $1,100, 
they've got to move up to about 2200 or 2500 for a brand new apartment. Sure. So they're not prepared to pay 22 or 2500. They're also really not prepared to pay 800 and rent the classic because they want something more than that. Sure. But they're prepared to pay the the 1100 with a really nicely done pool and a leasing office and and yeah, all and the and amenities I think done. The, even the the thing like a washing machine and dryer that is so important, you know, if you say to the lady of the house, will you pay $50 more a month if I put in a washing machine dryer, she'll wrestle her husband to the ground to have the washing machine and dryer in the unit. Right. 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 And what's really cool is that in this process of doing it for five years, so the first thing is you recognize and you go, hey, there's a value add process that needs to be done. Then the second approach is how do you standardize it? How do you do it? Yeah. Because we've standardized it now where where every building we buy, we only paint it one of three colors. Right. Every renovated suite we do, we use the same towel bar, the same appliances, sure. the same flooring. Everything's done exactly identical. Well, it's also buying in bulk. Buying yeah. in bulk. But what's really amazing is that that lets you go fast, right? right? Because last year we renovated 1,059 units across <laughs> our portfolio, yeah. right? The first year I think we did 200. Yeah. So last year we did 1,059. This month we're going to renovate 235 units. Just this month. This month. So in one month we'll do literally one-fifth of what we did. You can say that fast, but <laughs> in the same breath you probably need dozens of people. Doesn't those suppliers, doesn't it all lined up and timing and managed. Has one, to be managed. One guy full time, all he does is drive the Gold Star renovations and he drives it to do it fast. It used to take us 16, 17 days to do the renovation. Sure. Now we can do it in nine days. So it's just it's just all about and but if you think about it, real estate as an industry, you kind of say to yourself, why didn't all this come years ago? Because it's this standardization, you wouldn't go into a subway sandwich shop in Montreal and walk inside a sandwich subway sandwich shop in Montreal and it would look completely different than the one in Toronto or the one sure. in Calgary. They all look the same, right? You know from your years yeah. in the real estate. You want all your offices to look the same. Sure. You want your collateral. So th that's really all we've this. done is we've taken yeah. kind of the franchising concept of standardizing and, and, and because every building you buy, you're not spending all your time trying to decide hey, I wonder what color I should paint it. Sure. And then the property manager says, oh, we have this beautiful pink and brown. Have you tried this color? <laughs> yeah. And you go, no, I don't want that color. I want one of my three standard Everyone colors. Everyone has a favorite. You right. know? And you have to have the same, uh, the same kind of a feel and look. And it helps every building Correct. in there yeah, as you do it. Think about McDonald's. I mean, do you go there because the food tastes so <laughs> good? Or do you go there because it's so healthy for you? You go there because you know exactly what you know what it looks like. The arches are there. Number two, you bite in the hamburger. It tastes exact, good, better, and different. You get it quick, right? It tastes exactly the same as, and that's really the secret. Now you've just taken sort of that model and put it into real estate, and it seems to work really well. Why Phoenix? Well, again, Phoenix. You know, I look at the where the people are going. There'll be a hundred thousand people move to Phoenix again this year. So it's 100,000 people migrating into Phoenix. Uh, you know, it's gonna be one of the job creators in the nation, number one in job creation, number two, number one, two or three in job in employment. So, you know, you've got employment, you've got population, you've got people moving there. Sure. And, you know, at the prices we're buying at, there's still a lot of room before someone new is gonna come in and start building new. We're, we're in the B and the C class apartment space. So we're buying a B building, moving it to a B plus, we're buying a C building and we're moving it up to a C plus. So the money that's coming in to build, they all want to build the trophy apartment buildings. They sure. want to build the A buildings with the nice vaulted yeah. ceilings and brand new, but they're out to try to get that $2,300, $2,500 a month rent. So the B building, the rents are going to have to get up to about $2,000 before it makes sense for someone to come in and start building new units. So, so today we're buying at you know, 100, 110, $120,000 a unit. You've probably got another 50% increase in those prices well, before someone Particularly because new. you buy it also, some of your model is you want to be close to a college, you want to be close to large employers, right? Correct. So that, that then fill your building. Correct. Yeah, yeah and I mean, you know, mm -hmm. one of the absolute crazy things about the business. Janet is a, you know, she's just a wizard. She's a, you know, she's got a, the acquisition team is phenomenal. So, you know, Janet's a computer scientist, as you know. Yes, so yeah. in her world, 
there's no gray area. Like a deal is either a zero or a one. It either works or it doesn't work. So, and it works because it's, it's a formula. How many washer dryers can we put in? How many can units can we renovate? What kind of rent increases are we gonna get? And you know, she'll even look at the model where, where we'll take an overall model and, and even though we're completely redoing the landscaping and the signage and the, the pool area and the leasing office, she won't build in rental increases because of those things, even though you're gonna get rental increases from them. She only builds the increases into things that we can tangibly note that make us additional money. If you put a washer dryer in, you get $50. If you get $50, you know, the crazy thing about the real estate business is that for every $50 rental increase you get, you increase the value of the building by $10,000. That's the gross rent multiplier. That's the gross rent multiplier that you and Ralph, Ralph's one of the better guys at actually talking about it. But, you know, so if you think about it, so I say this to people, we have an on-site team and yesterday at one of the properties, they leased up three units. Those three units they leased up, they got a $200 rent increase on all three of those units. So that person made that building in one day worth $40,000 a unit times three, $120. $120,000, okay? So I don't know what they do at a car dealership when the car dealership sells something and makes $120,000. But in our world, we make a big deal of that. Sure, of and in the property management world, typically people don't make a big deal of it. They just say, hey, that was a good job. How'd you do, Bob? Well, Bob got me $200 more right. rent. Now, if everybody went the other way and said, Bob made me $120,000, they might treat Bob a lot differently. So we do celebration lunches. We do, we do sure. gift certificates. We do a lot of things. Well, because the important thing is that you, you increase the value of the building. You then can go back to the bank saying, hey, look at our income. Look at what we did. You might refinance. You have options. You don't have to, but you have the option to maybe refinance. And in some cases, you use that refinance money to pay some of the investors back half of their capital or more. And so then they are happy to go into the next building. I mean, it's a model that is well sought out right through from beginning to end and it works because you look at the little things a little increase you have one thing is the loss lease that you look at you know like i pay 700 over there george pays 900 the only thing i have to do is get me aussie to 900 and there's that extra 200 dollars i did not actually increase beyond what the market will bear and i think that's a big secret and if you have a hundred thousand or two hundred thousand going in and a loss to lease you know the value of the building will increase accordingly right i mean if, if we, we do a tour a couple times a year to both Phoenix and now Dallas, and we take all the investors yeah. that are interested. So people say, you know, Dave, this sounds really great. I'd like to come and see it. And we tour them around on a bus and we show them a building that we're about to buy, one that we bought a couple months ago and one that we've owned for yeah. six months. And they actually, you know, it's like watching one of those home decorating shows when you see what they did yeah. to the basement suite and you just can't believe what they the did. So. Well, that's what happens with our investors is they come down there and they go, you know, Dave, this is unbelievable. Like, I can't imagine this building you bought that you've turned into this. And so yeah. when they see what we bought, they go, I, you know, I, I get why it was only renting for 800. And when it's finished, they go, my gosh, now I sure. see how you got $1,100. And if we can get the units from $800 to $1,100, and we can do it in three years or two years, the investors make a 100% return on their equity. Yeah. So the returns we've been getting, which you know have been quite phenomenal, have really been based on on that that simple premise. You know, are you in a good market? Is there a demand for this? Because these buildings have to be transformed, right? And the way most of the investors have said to me that they really get it is they go, you know, Dave, I wouldn't stay out at an old motel by the airport, <laughs> but I would stay at a Holiday Inn. I'd stay at a Holiday Inn Suites. So if you can convert that old motel into a, into a Holiday Inn Suites, I would stay there. And that's, and that's really what the business is. And but I think that's also why you and Janet are a good match. By the way, all the OzBuzz listeners, if you want to listen to Janet's part of the equation, the founding partner, co-partner of uh, Dave, and go to OzBuzz number two and you can listen to her story. I love the way she says, I have the three S's, you know, when I get scared, I say to myself, shut up. <laughs> <laughs> and when I want to stay in there, I say, suck it up, you know, like very down to earth, very basis, but she has a model. Like you say, she's a financial analyst. 
you have a model. I mean, your novel model won you a Georgia Award for the best residential development in BC in, in 2006. Where was that? On Vancouver Island, I guess. Now. Vancouver Island, we did a project. We have a development company here in Canada, and we, uh, we build a fair amount of stuff for the government. Um, we're one of the largest residential builders up in Northeast BC in Fort St. John. Uh, we're building, we, we really, it's exactly the same thing. We've, we have a lot of investors that want to go to the States. We have a lot of investors that want to come to Canada. So if they come to Canada, they go, hey, I want to invest my money in BC. I'd like to own three rental properties. So, you, so we sit down and say, okay, where do we think are the best markets going to be? And the markets we like, we really like Surrey. I think, you know, Surrey's going to grow by 300,000 people over the next, the next 15 years. Uh, we like Fort St. John, this, this big announcement of the $40 billion with LNG. Um, you know, it's going to completely transform the North. Um, and we like Victoria for, again, all the same reasons. Sure. Yeah. Vancouver is getting too expensive. And so you say to yourself, when it gets too expensive and it prices people out, where are they going to go? Sure. The companies are moving out to Surrey and a lot of the companies are moving to Victoria and a lot of the companies are moving to the Okanagan. So, so it's how do, you, how do you target those areas and what kind of product do you build that the clients that want to own titled real estate can buy and get a, get a good deal on? Yeah, no question, and that's the, the whole idea is, I mean, look, uh, my partner Ralph uh, Case, who's also an Ozbuzz, uh, uh, what is that, an aficionado, <laughs> I guess, uh, uh, we have also our system. We, we look for our investors, and like you talk about Surrey, we, we, we sold some pre-sale units that appreciated 50%. Yeah, I mean, we, we certainly have the privilege also to work with you in the States. A lot of our investors... Uh, and we go down there, we take a look at the building, we see the model, we see the upside, and that's important for the investor to say, you know what, they've done it at this building, they've done it in this city, it's likely going to happen here. I mean, I went down to the building in Houston, I keep forgetting the name, but I really liked it, it was all brick. Wimbledon. Wimbledon, yeah, it was all brick construction. German neighborhood. That's why I was <laughs> going to come to it, you know, <laughs> the, 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 the high school has a German name and they have a, they have a downtown in Sherman, of course it had to be good. The point is, it was a great little town and it had all the right uh, the right things to do so tell me i mean you're doing things differently in an industry that hasn't changed for years is that the secret so i think there's two secrets i think the first secret would be this whatever area you're going to be going into really ask yourself what the wave is behind you that's going to make you look really smart yeah. right you know, what's the wave in Surrey? Why, why are your people making 50% sure. and why are they gonna probably keep making good money over time? Is Surrey has gone and spent 14 or $15 billion building out all that infrastructure. Right. So they really have done the build it and they will come. So if you go and do your research on Surrey, you can see Huge. this massive 50 foot wave that all you have to do is stand, stand in front yeah. of it yeah. and you're gonna look really smart in yeah. five years. Yeah. So again, the same thing I believe in Victoria, the same thing I believe with the markets we're looking in the US and the same thing in, in Northeast BC. So you know, people say to me, Dave, do you think we should buy in Calgary? Do you think we should buy in Edmonton? And I go, first of all, I think the first break of the wave is happening with Jason mm -hmm. Kenney getting elected. Yeah. I think that's a good thing. So, yeah. But the day you really need to know is when the Trans Mountain Pipeline is going to get right. approved. Because if you knew tomorrow that that was going to get sure. approved and it was going to be approved in a month, get in front of that wave because yeah. it's going to be really good. But that might be another Until year, it it might be another two years. It's the craziest thing. I had the privilege this year to travel through Oman and uh, Dubai and Abu Dhabi. And wherever we got to talking over, over dinner with some uh, locals, they all come back to how much they love oil. You know, I mean, the oil has been, inshallah, God willing, it'll keep up forever. My dad's grandfather lived in a tent and here's the tallest building. And here in Canada, we look at our oil and we somehow feel apologetic. It's that, that we have this. Everybody else wants it an asset. It's not just Canada. The United States considered, considers its oil a great asset. You know, on fights like hell, they build something like 35 miles of, uh, of pipe, well, we haven't built one, you know, it is in the same kind of a time frame. So, well, again, I think that mood will change. Yeah. Is it going to happen this year or next year or the following year? I think that's your real question as a real estate investor, Ozzy. That's really the question. I think the mood will change. I think people are going to get fed up very quickly of the fact that there's been all this 
yeah. interference. You know, this whole environmental yeah. thing now That's is coming out as a scam. But leave all the politics aside, which I'm not yeah. here to talk politics. But, yeah. but as a real estate investor, the first secret in my mind is, is get behind the wave. Because, you know, if people say to me, what about this area? I go, tell me what yeah. the wave is that you're... That you know that you're that's going to run you over. That's sure. going to just that by default you're going to look really good. It's like like we always say, it, people uh, <coughs> values go where people go, and there's a trend usually. I think there's also a trend into the into the inner cities again. And Surrey is a city. We always see Surrey as a, as this big sort of a farm area. It isn't. It's all. It's a great city, and as you said, it has tremendous infrastructure, and the prices are relatively low compared to certainly uh, to Vancouver. So you talked about repeatability and scalability. Yeah, I, again, you know, the whole thing is, is that, you know, you know, they say what what's the the best marketing slogan ever written? Yeah. Remember what it was? If it absolutely has to be there, <laughs> something like FedEx, you know, <laughs> FedEx. has to be there tomorrow. Yeah. It was shampoo, <laughs> yeah. rinse, repeat. Oh yeah, of course. And it was the fact that they <laughs> added that one word so that everybody that shampooed their hair suddenly thought that they had to do it twice, right? Yeah. So all of a sudden shampoo sales doubled because yeah. every time you washed your hair... Well, it was actually, mm -hmm. you know, and you put me on the spot, I can't remember <laughs> him, but it's a spe specific guy who was hired by, uh, I, I, I think it was Alberto Rio 5 or something, but the idea was that uh, he was going to be paid, I believe, something like $8,000. Yes, no, I just want a small percentage of the increase. And he, he got an incredible increase because, yeah, look at it. We, will, we live in instructions, right? So you look at the instructions as, you know, repeat. And so mm -hmm. look at it tonight. You'll find out, you know, rinse and, and repeat. And people do right now. Can we do that in mm -hmm. real estate? <laughs> well, sure. So, so you take an example. So you've been to a number of our buildings. We put up these gaudy yellow and black signs in front of our yeah, building. Okay. Sure. Now, what do they do? They double the traffic from, from when we don't have the signs. So when you drive by, you see these gaudy yellow and black signs. The day we take over a building, 25 of these yellow and back black signs go up. The monument sign goes up. For the first 25 or 30 buildings we did, we did 25 or 30 different monument yeah. signs. <laughs> now we have three color codes. Yeah. We're either painting the building crimson, we're painting yeah. it blue, or we're painting it yeah. Arizona. We have three different color codes. If we're painting it blue, then we know exactly what the monument sign goes with the blue paint. If we're painting sure. it crimson, we know exactly what color it goes. So all of a sudden, all the decisions start with one decision. What color sure. are you painting it? Then from that, we know exactly what color the lawn furniture around the pool is going to be. Yeah. Then we go inside, we know what all our signage inside the building is going to be. Well, so then if you be like a McDonald's and you have your 50,000 units in every city and people walk into that color scheme, oh, that looks kind of familiar, must be good. Right. And even more importantly is that they walk into a building in Houston and from, from the standpoint, because the one thing I've learned about this business and, and anyone that's in it, even, even if you own three properties, right? You spend an awful lot of time talking to your property manager about things you really shouldn't waste your time talking about. Right. Because they're really just an opinion. What color do you think the building should be painted? Yeah. Do you think the, the, the monument sign should be round? Should it be yeah. square? How big should the font be? What should it say? So once it's standardized and you're not spending all that time, Ozzy, right. what it really does is it gives you time to spend on the places where yeah. you can really make your money. Yeah. What are the things you can do to go and attract 10 new leases? Because yeah. what do I want? I want my on-site team generating leases. I want them spending- You want a busy time doing being productive. I want them spending two days a yeah. week outside of the office calling on all the businesses in the neighborhood. FedEx is moving into the neighborhood. They've just yeah. hired 100 people. How do I get into the, into the HR office yeah. of FedEx so when their next 10 people move to Phoenix, sure. the number one choice is one of our buildings to rent from. So to me, it's really about the property management business has really been a business of order taking and it's never really been a business of sales. So if you can transform your property management team really into being a sales team, and if they can understand that every $100 rent increase makes $20,000 and sure. they can see reward and enthusiasm, like we literally get a, we get an email every single day at four o'clock from every one of the 50 properties that we own and it lists how many units rented that day, what price they rented for. 
It goes to every executive in our company at Western Wealth, every executive and at the, the property management that. company, and the people know that. And between four o'clock, yeah. if you rent a unit in a day, Ozzy, yeah. between four o'clock and four thirty, you might get ten or fifteen replies to sure. that email back to the on-site leasing person yeah. Yeah. saying, "Tom, hey, good that's product. fantastic. Yeah. Way to go!" Now, we did this. We did this about six months ago. Is one of the guys that oversaw the landscaping at the properties. Did, did a phenomenal job landscaping this one area. And one of the asset managers went out and saw it and he said, you know, this is amazing. So he went up to, to, to Jose on the site yeah. and he took a picture with yeah. Jose yeah. and he gave him a hundred dollar gift card yeah. to go to TGI Fridays. And he put his arm around him mm -hmm. and he took a picture with Jose and he took a picture and he circulated that sure. to every on-site team, every property manager and everybody within our company. Yeah. Now, over the course of that day, Jose must have got 50 sure. attaboys, Jose way to go. How do you think he felt? Yeah, how do you think he felt? Yeah. Two days later, Jose finally chimes in on the email. And his email was, I've worked for the property management company for 19 years, mm -hmm. and this is the first time an owner has ever said thank you. See, there you are. Right? right? So I tell people, that's the bar yeah. we're jumping over, right? It's not that high a bar. No. Right, so it's but and, and I think it's absolutely vital. I sometimes wonder about the success of Facebook or why do people have the likes or whatever. Right. And I remember as a general manager of LePage, I used to call uh, salespeople that quit and I said, Oh, you know, George, can you tell me, you know, what was the reason? I never forget this young woman, uh, she had gone to the other company and I said, Look, you know, what can I do different? Ah, uh, no, I don't want to tell you. No, come on, tell me. And she says, Well, you know, it's George who was office number one. On Monday morning, yeah, George. And then there's the new agent. Oh, he got his first. Yeah, and me, I'm in the middle, and I never get anybody telling me anything. But the manager of the other office, who obviously was smarter than me, right? He recognized what I do, right? He appreciates what I did, and I go there. And I thought to myself, that is actually the person we want. The first guy we paying too much commission. The bottom guy probably never succeeds. With the people that are there in the middle, we never value them. And today on Facebook. You point out, I'm eating a hamburger and nine people like it. And I know it's silly, but you feel kind of good. And if nobody likes eating a hamburger, you publish, you know. The point is, so we are being appreciated. And when you can incorporate that in your company, which you're doing, you're going to have success because we want to feel good. We want to, particularly when somebody recognizes something that I did good and tells me about it, right? Jose, that was a good job done. Well, there was a survey. And in the survey, it said that the only person who has lower job satisfaction <laughs> than a property manager is a prison guard. <laughs> so well. if you put it in that perspective, yeah. you know, and so what do we do as owners of, what do we do as real estate investors? Yeah. Yeah. The only time we ever choose to call the property manager yeah. is when we're pissed off and we call and we beat up on them, right? Yeah. So the whole concept is, how do you reverse that and how do you and the other side of it is that's that I love about the four o'clock emails is that it's now it's democracy sure right I get to I get the information directly from the on-site team because if I fly into Phoenix and I go meet the president of the property management company they really don't know truthfully what's going on at all sure, 20 of my properties in Phoenix yeah, sure. but most of the time, they now know because they're in the same four o'clock emails, they're seeing everything that's happening. <laughs> sure. So they're forced to know about my properties. And you know, you can also tell very, very quickly by the email chains which of your on-site team are good and which well, ones and are Well, and you ones. have lifted the standards. You know, I mean, I come from a sales organization with this president of Royal Peach in terms of standards. I said, watch my lips. There was an argument about what the sign should like. This is our sign, that's what you, and that's where your name goes. But the most important thing, by the way, I should say when you say 50 properties, it's not 50 houses. We're talking each mm -hmm. property has 150 to 200 units. Am I right? You know, it's not just 50 properties. Yeah, no, it's, yeah. it's about 12,000 units. <laughs> yeah, so I just wanted to clarify <laughs> that. But, but you're, you're, you're so right. You're, you're managing it, you're setting standards, and then you congratulate on those standards, and you enforce those standards. If a guy doesn't send in his daily report, you know, he, uh, well, I don't think he would last very long under the... Uh, well, it's an interesting thing because each property management company typically has five or six regional managers. So one of the first things we try to do is make sure that we're dealing with the best regional manager, right? Because if you've got the best regional manager, 
there's no one who's a really good regional manager that doesn't have really good on-site teams. Sure. They're not just going to suddenly no. go, of my seven on-site teams, I have five that are really good and two that are terrible, right? No. Now, if I found the worst regional manager in that property management company, what I've probably found is the gold mine to buy all the properties from, yeah. right? Yeah. Because people say, Dave, what's the business model? Yeah. I go, if you really want to know the business model is, we find the worst property manager, the, the worst yeah. regional manager, yeah. we yeah. buy all his properties yeah. and we move them over to their best person, yeah. right? Because the best regional manager, the difference is what they're prepared to tolerate. They have right. a lower level of what we tolerate. Well, and if you tolerate mediocrity, it, it right. goes down from there. Well, I think that one of your tenants is that the biggest, most important asset in the real estate business are people. Absolutely. Yeah. And again, you know, Janet's fantastic because there's a real benefit to, I don't want to sound sexist here, but there's a real benefit to women. Sure. Women, you know, Janet has a heart to this business that really that really attracts a lot of people in the sure, business. No question. The fact that. that the fact that she wants to give away free rent to people and right. we give away one one tenant that's worthy of it every December gets their rent given to them for sure. free. Yeah. People go, Dave, why would you give away a thousand dollars? Well, because the that person now they don't just automatically one person from every building in, gets yeah. it, but that gets voted in and the on-site team has to think of someone right away that they know that needs it. And so, you know, example of one of the properties last year, the lady lost her husband in December. Sure. It was a two-income family with three kids. She was having a really rough go of it. So all of a sudden she gets her, her month. Makes her, a big her, difference right, to her. Makes a great difference to her, but it also makes a phenomenal sure. difference to that on-site team sure. because now they're more connected to us. And the other tenants saying, hey, you know, that right. they really stand for something. Well, Dave, you know, and I, I'm in the marketing business. We have clients, and as I said, we sell some of your product, we sell other products. And we're always wondering, you know, what makes people buy. And I think you have sort of an answer why it is so hard for people to buy sometimes, even when the deals get better, it's hard for them to buy. Well, you know, it's the phenomena today, right? There's all this uncertainty in Vancouver, which means whenever there's uncertainty, you know, write offers. Go yeah. find a deal. Go That's find right. a deal in an area you, you stink, like. Right stink bits. And call it a deal of a lifetime. And yeah. go figure out how you make that deal right. of a lifetime, right? Or, you know, f first of all, get behind the wave. So the mm -hmm. first step is wherever you're going to be, don't just go buy a deal somewhere because it's cheap. That's probably the biggest mistake we I see people coming into real sure, estate. Yeah. I'm going to go pick an area oh, just yeah. because it's dirt cheap. Yeah. So find an area where there's a reason that it's going to go up in value, that the region's going to go up in value. And, you know, I, I don't know why the fear comes, but the fear creates the uncertainty. So for some reason, we think a good market is where 10 people wrestle each other to the ground in the living room of the seller and pay 50000 too much when a ma market where the realtor has time and where you can really be selective and make offers and people actually will look at offers we are we back off the, and yet you make the most money on the day you buy and usually is that the time not at the top of the market but in the bottom of the market Dave it's been a remarkable pleasure I think that time just zoomed by and I thank you for sharing the wisdom I know that the Ozbuzz audience understands that they were privileged to have from somebody who don't just talk about it Somebody that actually does it, lives it, breathes it every day. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Thank you.